We're so glad to have you here tonight. Welcome to the Writer's Bridge. I'm Allison K. Williams, and I've written uh, seven drafts, self-edit like a pro from blank page to book, which is coming out September uh, 7th, I believe. But if you're coming to Hippocamp or the Woodhall Writers Conference, you're going to have access to an early copy. Ashley, Ashley Renard is my co-host. Ashley, tell us about your book real quick. Yeah, my book, Swing, a memoir of doing it all, came out May 25th. I independently, pub independently published, and the sales are amazing. And I'm actually going on my in-person part of my book tour starting today, heading to Detroit for a private event, and then Philadelphia, and then just, I'm only adding a couple at a time, but quite exciting. Oh, and I had my first in-person event last week locally where I interviewed Candice Bushnell, which was super fun. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. She had fancy shoes, too. And we have a very special guest with us tonight, which is Donna Tallarico. Donna is an amazing writer. You've probably seen her work in Writer's Digest, among many other places. You might have also seen her work in places you didn't even know you were seeing it, because Donna has done a lot of fabulous copywriting as well. And Donna is here tonight to talk to us about Books by Hippocampus, which is the press that she is the editor-in-chief of. She's also going to talk to us about what it's like to pitch to magazines and her top tips for getting your work in there. And she's going to tell us about the Hippocampus Creative Nonfiction Conference, which is coming up in August and which I know a lot of us are having kind of a little Writer's Bridge reunion at. Hello, Donna. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. I tried to type it into the chat, but my chat's being a little wonky, my keyboard. So, <laughs> I'm from Northeast Pennsylvania. So if you are here for the first time, uh, we call this the writer's bridge, even though we are talking about platform, because a platform is a thing that you get up on and yell at people from. And a bridge is a two-way street where you find your readers and your readers find you. And it's uh, communication in both directions. Um, Donna, will you start us off with a nice, easy thing? It's so simple, so easy. How the heck do we get published in a magazine just like that? Oh, well, I wish there was a magic bullet. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think um, the number one tip that, that I would have for pitching to a magazine and pitching successfully to a magazine is just coming in and showing passion about a topic, expertise about, and also expertise about the topic. So I think those are the two biggest things. So I don't know if you wanted a quick answer, or if you want me to dive a little deeper into so, it. So yeah, dive a little deeper for us. So how, when we send out that pitch email, and, and we've talked on the Writer's Bridge before about the key parts of the, the pitch to a magazine, which is why this topic for this magazine, why now, why is it important to talk about it right now, and why am I the very best person to write this? So Donna, tell us in that context, how do we show that we're passionate? How do we show that we're an expert? Great. Yeah, I think there's two different ways you could think of pitching. Um, one is if you are a freelance writer or just trying to earn some extra income and do some of the journalist, journalism and research-based stories. So that's one part of it. But on the building platform part of it also, if you're trying to build up your expertise to market your book, build your platform, you can also write on your subject matter expertise. And that's sort of what I try to do. Um, my day job is in higher education, marketing and communications. And I learned a lot of um, web and techie things that I haven't really seen in the writing area. So I tried to find gaps, which is a good piece of advice to find gaps that um, maybe there's not enough information about it or from that angle. So I pitched a bunch of writers to, or sorry, a bunch of articles to the writer magazine over the past couple of years about things like email newsletters, accessibility, um, how to make your website accessible to people who might be interacting with it through a screen reader or who can't use a mouse. Um, so I just, um, so I was able to use some of my day job type things to say, this is why I'm an expert in it, but I want to bring it into this other, for this other new audience. That's I love fantastic. That. Sorry, I love ahead, how Ashley. you're. Yeah, I love how you're talking about gaps, Donna, because we talk about that a lot in the idea about comp authors or comp accounts on social media to really get an idea of the writers right now on social media or in literary magazines or wherever you want to make a presence at conferences. The people who are speaking on the topics that are really similar to what you speak on speaking to the audiences, writing to the audiences that you want to speak to, and then finding those gaps. If you pay attention to what 
information that person's putting out and the questions that are coming back in the comment threads or in the newsletter FAQs, you're going to really start to notice where your unique experience, like you were saying in higher ed and tech will fit in. Can you share with us a few more examples? Um, because I think, you know, examples help to jog in all of us where we could mimic the same thing. What are some things that you thought were kind of like commonplace or a little bit boring, but then when you saw, oh, maybe writers want to know about this, you got a good response. Yeah, I think um, the accessibility that I sort of mentioned about before. Um, so for example, a lot of people might do visual based um, things on Instagram where there's no text involved in it. And I see writers do that all the time. And it's kind of boring to talk about accessibility standards, but colleges and universities are getting sued for, for this. So I think it's something really important to bring up. Um, and now I'm doing some workshops on it. And they're not really techie workshops, but it's more of a, this is why it's important. And here are some quick tips about it because I'm not a programmer. But I've just, so that it kind of morphed from having some articles out there to speaking opportunities about something. So it does kind of sound a little boring when you're talking about code and behind the scenes. Um, and I think another area is also, um, and this is becoming more and more popular now that Twitter has, has grown, but crisis communications. Um, like coming up from the working in marketing and communications, you know, what, what happened, we're getting ready to send out this tuition increase letter, but how do we prepare for that? Because we know there's going to be backlash. So in a lot of talks that I do, and I haven't pitched an article about this yet, but crisis communications for an author um, and what you need to look for. So again, those are some things you might think about um, a pharmaceutical company having to deal with it or a, a tire manufacturer. You know, we know, we all know the big stories of, that happened in the news about the crises, but what about the small little Twitter storms? How do we handle that? I so like that. Sorry, go ahead, Sorry. Ashley. Uh, that really just reminds me of some very bad crisis management that writers have had recently. Like Rachel Hollis, every time there's a bit of a hiccup, she turns it into an inferno because she handles it so poorly. Um, and I think a lot of us, as we're expanding our platforms and putting our work out in broader and larger ways, the fear and the vulnerability just of having a wider scope um, makes it just makes it more probable that we may have to have some savvy and some strategy if we come into something like that. So I would love, I would love to read that if you pitch that article, Donna. I think it might. I'll so, move that up my list. <laughs> so Donna, I think the biggest crisis that we're all bracing for, those of us who are memoirists, is someone I love is going to read my memoir and they're going to get mad at me. What would you recommend for uh, for, for crisis handling on that? How should the writer plan for that? You know, I think that's, it's such a big question and there's so much to consider, but what I would recommend is you might know the triggers that other people might have, or you might like, even though it's your truth, you might know that your aunt might say that, or your cu cousin might say that, or your neighbor, like think of all the things that might, um, might spark a disagreement or something and get ahead of it write out those answers, write out those responses, and maybe you don't have to use them, but just working through that in your head and getting it out there sort of gives you that practice to, to do it. Um, so yeah, I would just say to just try and get ahead of it, almost like bracing for like a bad review or a critical review of your book. Like you might know what might be a perceived weak spot or what somebody might perceive as an issue in your book. And if you know that ahead of time, you can just kind of say, you know, you can just give a quick, quick answer rather than think about it. Or probably what happens in those Twitter storms, you just say something like with emotion rather than thinking about it. So I think those practice questions can really help. I agree. Even if what you practice is, I can certainly understand why you feel that way. Let me know when you write your version of it. And uh, Rhonda points out in a great way, she says, you know, apologize that they read it that way, not for your book, but that they received it that way. And it's your truth. They can write their own truth. Yeah. Yolande has a fabulous question. How did you transition from writing articles to getting speaker opportunities? How did you, how did you leverage your expertise from writing into speaking? Yeah, I, um, I sort of entered the e-commerce world 
just in time um, when social media was just becoming new for businesses. And then I got into the higher ed marketing and communications world also when they were sort of embracing it because businesses embrace technology at different stages. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time for, for some of these. So some of it was luck. But I recognized that a lot of people weren't talking about the topics that I'm familiar with at writing conferences. So I, but I was able to build up speaking credits at industry conferences, such as since I work in higher, higher ed, High Ed Web is one of the big conferences I go to, um, Edu Web, and then there's something called CASE, which is the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. So I found speaking opportunities within like my day job expertise. So that helped me build speaking credits. Then I was able to say, well, hey, I spoke at this conference, but I can bring this to a whole new audience. I could bring this to writers or I could bring this to small businesses. So it's kind of like, again, finding those gaps, finding something you're good at and are an expert in that can apply to other industries that might not like to Ashley's question before, it might seem boring to other places, but, but maybe it is relevant. Um, so where, where else can you take that? So I think that could help. Now, just like academic conferences, the conferences that I'm talking about speaking at, they're not paid speaking opportunities. They're not keynotes and things like that. That's more of a, I'm going to this conference and I'm speaking. But as you build up, you know, then maybe you could get those keynote gigs and, and those bigger speaking gigs. So Donna, what, what distinguishes, because when you run the Hippocampus Creative Nonfiction Conference, I know you have a committee who surveys the applications to speak that come in. Mm -hmm. What distinguishes a good speaking application from a great, we need it, we have to book this person speaking application? What are you looking for? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think this goes back to the advice for pitching editors to show why you and why now. Um, in addition to asking for a session abstract, we ask, why are you the speaker for this? And why do you want to be part of Hippocamp? because I think that's really important. It's a really special conference for those of you who have been there. It's just, it has a different vibe than some other conferences. And, and I think a lot of it is because we do open up to general speakers. You know, we don't go out and hire faculty or things like that. So it's a, it's a different setup. Um, so we look for expertise and passion in a topic. We, um, you know, we don't mind if somebody's a first time conference speaker because everybody needs a first time and we would love it if we were their, their first time. So we, if they don't have speaking experience, we look at other experience they have in front of, in front of people, um, but why they're passionate about it, how they wanna learn, how they wanna engage with the rest of the conference. We don't want somebody just to show up, speak and leave. And that has happened before. And those weren't very high, highly rated speakers. They didn't get all the extra stuff that you get out of a conference. So I'm being really wordy, but we look for passion and we look for why are you the best person to do this? And what do you want, what else will you bring to our conference community? Um, and we, we have people show a link for like articles they wrote or past speaking engagements. So that could help, but that's not um, required. And then finally, um, we do sometimes get a lot of session proposals on the same topic. So then again, that's where the passion comes into it. Tell us the topics that you get a lot of submissions for. What do, you, what do you get so many submissions? You'd have to really, re, really be amazing to stand out at that one. Yeah, the, the past, um, I, well, I guess we didn't really, last year we had a call for proposals, but we didn't have a conference. Um, but research and nonfiction, um, writing about family members, um, the science behind memory. Um, because of our name, Hippocampus, we, we sometimes get academic proposals like from psychology professors. And it's like, you didn't read our guidelines. <laughs> um, so we do get those. But I would say, um, you know, we get, we get some about using social media and we tend, and that's, I mean, the Writer's Bridge here is such a good example of it. There isn't, there can't just be a session on social media for writers that you can cover in 60 minutes because there's so much you can say about each topic. So we get really broad ones sometimes about platform as well. So we would really like those narrowed down. Yeah, that makes sense. I know I've taught a couple of social media related workshops at Hippocamp in the past. One of them was specifically write better with social media. Like how does social media teach you writing skills that you can use in the rest of your writing? And one was specifically just Instagram. Like how do we just use Instagram? So it, it sounds like you're looking for narrower but deep rather than a broad survey. Yes, yeah, exactly. That is a much more succinct way to say that. And I'm gonna remember that for next time. <laughs> well, well, and, and 
it Sorry, reminds ahead, me, it reminds me of the way that you make people think you're an expert in something is by telling them you're an expert in it and offering information about that on a consistent basis. That's what Allison and I did last summer, last August saying, hey, we're going to do a biweekly Q&A about building platform for writers. And now we have almost 1600 people signed up and we're starting to do Writer's Bridge Lives. Our first one's gonna be at Hippo Camp um, because we have just put out information consistently. So when you're looking at the gaps in your comp accounts and your comp authors, just what I, what I always say is the biggest strides I've made in my skating career in my short time, just two years now in publishing, are when I pretend as if. I pretend as if I'm going to be doing a keynote at a conference and you know what, I'm gonna get on my stories every day and I'm gonna talk about that topic. Or I'm going to put that in my, um, in my Facebook group post that I wanna make helpful. I'm going to act as if, as if I already have a book deal and I'm just gonna be making content on social media like I would be if I was like really ramping up for publicity. Those are the things that have led to real life opportunities. So I'm faking it till I make it. Um, but today I was on the Juicy Scoop Celebrity Gossip podcast. They usually talk to like people on The Bachelor and The Real Housewives of Beverly yeah. Hills. But I have just been talking about keeping monogamy hot. So one of the listeners suggested it to that really big podcast. They get 150,000 downloads per episode. So fake it till fake it till you make it like really just start talking about those things and somebody is going to notice that you speak well or write well on those topics and that topic will be of interest to either a journal or a conference give yourself permission to act like the expert you are working towards becoming act like it is your job before it is your job and Donna, watch this segue. One of your jobs is that you are the editor-in-chief of Books by Hippocampus. So when you are the editor-in-chief, what kind of submissions for manuscripts are you seeing? And what do you wish you were seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. We're, um, we're catching up on queries from our last reading period now. And, um, and there's a couple um, constraints that we have since we're a small a very small press, almost like micro press. We can only do a couple titles a year until we really get on our feet. So that just makes it so much harder to make decisions. Um, but, and I hate to use this answer, but sometimes we don't know what we're looking for until we see it. Um, so for example, when we put out our first call for book length, for book queries, um, you know, just since we're doing all creative nonfiction, I thought, well, we'll probably our first book will be a straight memoir or will be an essay collection. But then we got this illustrated memoir of cartoons with this little hippie girl growing up in Berkeley and a kid's commune. And it was going to be a little expensive to publish because there was a picture on every page. And but I thought, you know what, we're going to take a risk and go with this because I just I love this story and it surprised me. So um, so I really like that. So we are looking for different things. We're looking to take some risks. I mean, I guess we can't take too many risks or else we won't. <laughs> um, but we're looking for different things that other people might say no to. Um, something else that I personally have been really getting into is, um, you know, just more narrative nonfiction, like pop, pop science and books like that, like um, books like The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, where it's research based, but the narrators work into it. I would love to see more stuff like that. Um, I mean, those books are really selling, you know, aside from memoir, that's a segment of CNF that's really, that's really growing. Um, so I'd like and to we, have, it, we have a lot of those writers in this group too, who are doing um, narrative nonfiction in that way. It reminds me of a quote that Susan Shapiro shared in a Facebook group a couple of days ago that said, people want to pretend like publishing is a business, but really it's a casino. And that's the thing, publishers don't know what's going to be hot till it's hot. And sometimes it's like, you know, that you as the um, acquiring editor will just be like, I just have a feeling, I just have a feeling about this, right? I, I, I said this in, um, in figure skating, in judging figure skating, it is much more instinct based than anybody would want to, you know, we just have that, we have that reaction to some things that we read. Yeah. What mistakes do you see, Donna, when you get uh, when you get submissions? What kind of mistakes do you see that makes you go, mm, "Sorry, not this book, not this time"? 
Yeah, something I've been, um, you know, and, and I hate pushing that no button. I hate sending decline letters, but it's just, it's part of the job. But um, I would say the number one thing I see now that I turn down, especially because the competition is so fierce, is essay collections that do not have a thread, that do not have a, you know, some type of theme, um, that they're just kind of like, hey, I had a bunch of these essays published. I'm just going to put them together into this book with no rhyme or reason. Um, so it doesn't make the essays bad. It just means as a standalone book, it might not work. Um, and then on, as far as just the querying and proposal aspect of it, I see some people will send really great proposals that they're really thinking things out, you know, back to writing being a business. They're, they're including all those details, you know, about not just the story itself. And then there's some people that can't yet articulate what their book is about and why it matters. And so I don't even get through those cover letters to open up the open up the book because I'm not intrigued. So, so I would say, yeah, essay collections that aren't fully thought out, and then just queries or book proposals that miss the mark. So we've got another publisher here. We've got Math Matthew Winkler here from Woodhall Press, who are the people who are bringing out my book, Seven Drafts, Self-Edit Like a Pro from Blank Page to Book in September. Matt, I want to ask you the same question since we've got you here. Um, what makes you go, yes, this is absolutely our book. We cannot wait. And what makes you go, mm, sorry, we're not the right people for this book? I think um, I think Ashley hit it on the head with the that instinct, right? There's this kind of editorial, you know, eye that that you develop. And I, I work kind of behind the scenes. I'm more of the you know nuts and bolts uh, of keeping the business running. But um, you know, the editorial team, you know, really has a, a sharp ear for you know what everyone's saying here. You know, is this the right book for this moment? Is this author the right author for this book? Like, is this the only person or the best person on the planet to write this book? And, you know, if I had any advice for, for writers, that would be it is like, you know, if there's a book that only you can write, like no one else can write this book. That's the book I want to read. Like that's, I want to, I want you to send me that. I want to read those 10 pages. I want to charge into that editorial meeting, throw it on the table and say, we're printing this. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what makes you the right speaker to deliver the topic at a conference. That's what makes you the right person to pitch the article to the magazine. That's what makes your query the one that leads the agent or the publisher to read the pages to dig into the book that you show them right up front. I am exactly the person who needs to write this book. And I think that's true for novels as well as for nonfiction. And Allison, um, I loved how Donna said, you know, she doesn't get past that cover letter sometimes. I loved how Matt said, like, when he gets that idea, that person, like, knows exactly why they should write the book and he's feeling it too, he will fly through those 10 pages and bust right into, like, his other editor's offices and say, this, we got a book. Like, let's, and when you get that gut feeling, you really think, oh, and other people probably want this too. So you move, okay? People move quickly when they are directed by instinct, right? And Allison and I were both performers. Allison was a circus performer. I was a figure skater. You only have the first two seconds to let someone, you know, they're going to, you're going to make that first impression. That's why every word of your query letter, that's why every sentence of those first few pages has got to hit it out of the park. People are busy. They're, you can't be like, okay, the query letter's okay, but page three, I mean, the best writing that's ever graced this planet. You know what? Even if it is, they're not going to get to it. They're not going to get to it. So talking to somebody else, um, Jane Friedman helped me a lot because I made my book that's about sex clubs and um, racy, hilarious things sound like it was about political crit criticism. Like I couldn't have made that book sound more boring if I tried. Um, so getting someone else to take a look at it, because sometimes like proving that this was a worthy story to write is not actually the way to intrigue someone's interest about it. And one of the things that helps us show that we are the right person to write this book and that this is the book of the moment is 
got to say it, building your platform. Rachel mentions that her deaf themed expose and memoir is out on submission. She's getting feedback from big houses that they like the book, but they don't think the market is big enough. But it's not a niche book. It's written for a lay person hearing audience. And Elena says she gets the same feedback about queer centered books, even those with universal themes. Big publishers have no idea how big the audience actually is. And it sucks that this is the writer's responsibility but it is the writer's responsibility to determine which readers need your book and how can you be in touch with them. And that might be on social media, that might be through public speaking, that might be the congregation of your church, that might be the population of your professional association or your alumni association, but you gotta tell the publisher specifically, these are the people who want to read this book and here is where I already am connected to them. And I love that we have Donna and Matthew here who are both from smaller presses because I'll, I'll jump to you in a second, Donna. I find that bigger publishers are just trying to jump on trends. Like they kind of like, th they have a lot of books that they put out every year. They throw everything at the wall, see what sticks. Or they, they look over and they see what's sticking over there. When I was talking to Candace Bush no, la last week, she said, Sex and the City came out the same time as Bridget Jones's Diary. And then every publisher, all they wanted were chick lit. That's sort of like when it started, like books like that, because, oh, women buy books like that. And those were the people they were signing. They weren't even entirely sure what that was or who was buying them. Like, um, I think when we are engaging with our audience or when we have a smaller press, like these two editors do, you get a clearer idea because you don't have as many darts to just toss of what works and why because i think it's the why that makes it um makes it easy to you can replicate it if you're not sure why you're just rolling the dice all the time donna yeah i was i was going to go back to um the query letter um especially for magazine pitching um it's it's kind of the same thing there's sometimes you know you're just clearing your throat in that letter you're saying why you got the idea for the story or when you you know how the idea came together and Editors are busy. I mean, I'm guilty of it. I open my email and I'm like, this is too long. I'm going to read it later. So, you know, you have to be able to sell your story and writing a query letter, writing marketing copy is very different than being a creative writer. And so that's a skill you really have to learn and fine tune. And like Allison at the session, she talked about it, Hippocamp, you know, how social media writing can help you as a writer. It's because you're going to learn to write those quick punchy sentences and headlines and things like that. And when you're approaching your query letter um, and even maybe part of your proposal, you need to think like that. And you can't just, you know, bore us. Like Tom Petty said, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> so we are a chorus of writers. And one of the things that we do is we get together. And the past uh, 18 months or so getting together has not been wise or safe. Um, but now we are launching into Hippocamp. So Donna, why should we come to Hippocamp? What is so darn great about your writing conference? Go ahead and brag. All right. <laughs> the, the Hippocampus community um, in general is just so great. Um, every time we publish a new issue, we tag all the, um, all the writers in it. And then there's like friendships that form just from being in the same issue. And so it's just kind of, like some of those bonds you make online, but then it happens in real life. And I think because we focus just on creative nonfiction, it's a lot of people with the same issues, the same, what will my family think? Or how can I tell this? Do, do I need to change my name? And so everybody's dealing with not just the same writer issues, but the same writing about personal stories. And so everybody there, it's just, you're instantly relatable to each other because of that. Um, and everybody learns and shares with each other. I just love that everybody mingles. Like we've had some bigger name keynotes in the memoir field like Tobias Wolf, and he went to sessions the entire time he was there taking notes. And it just shows that you're never, no matter how successful you are, you can always learn something new and everybody has something new to offer. So I just love that energy of sharing. And I love what happens after. You know, I see friendships form and different projects, you know, and collaborations that come out of it. And it's just fantastic. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just about mingling with people because you, you're going to come back with a lot um, 
But, but I think what's different about Hippocamp and some other writing, more academic writing conferences is we focus on practical um, knowledge, like one rock star speaker in front of the room instead of just panels where, you know, everybody's talking over each other. So it's just, it's engaging and it's there and you can be present. And um, Sorry, go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, question from the chat, Donna. We have some people in the in the Zoom who are on the fence about coming to Hippocamp because of the news of the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. um, and I've talked to some people about this too. And like, you know, they're at a well visit at their pediatrician and the doctor is saying, okay, do you as the parent, even though you're vaccinated, have any plans this summer to travel? What are the precautions going to be there? Um, can you talk about your work with the conference organizers and with the Marriott, what the plans are? Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, if any of you are going to the conference or have been looking at it, you might see that the um, schedule doesn't have locations yet. So we're waiting until we find out what the current, um, like what the current recommendations are for groups. So we're already planning on having seating farther apart. Um, but what we might do is if we do need to have seats farther apart, we might reconfigure our space. So instead of having like a smaller room for a breakout session, we might double the size of that room. So we're being really conscious with that. Um, the Marriott is kind of handling their own, um, you know, the cleanliness and, and all of that. Um, we are gonna have more spaced out registration tables. So instead of just having one, we're gonna have a couple. Um, we also have a, a conference bookstore and we're gonna set up multiple browsing stations rather than have like, your book is just here, it will be here, here and here. So that way people can spread out and look at books more. Um, will we be wearing masks? Yeah, that I'm not, I'm not 100% sure if they're going to require that. We're probably going to do like a um, survey of our own audience and attendees and see how they feel about it. Um, we definitely would recommend anybody wearing a mask that they feel that they should be wearing a mask. Um, I don't know if it's going to be protocol or not at the conference yet. Um, we should have a decision on that soon. Um, and then the other change we're making is food. We usually have buffets. So we're gonna have a regular buffet line, but we're also gonna have a buffet line that they, the people will serve you. So it's like not everyone's gonna be grabbing the tongs that just the employee is gonna be. Um, and we're moving, we have an opening cocktail reception and that's moving to a bigger location as well. So everything can be more spread out. So we're definitely being mindful of the spacing and all of that. Um, and then also accepting hugs where we feel comfortable because we miss hugs. <laughs> <laughs> will any of the conference be remote? No, unfortunately, um, just with our budget, because Hippocampus really is a, just a break-even event, we don't have the budget to live stream. We, for those of you who don't know, we have four concurrent sessions going on, and it would be out of our budget to have four live streams at a time, and plus with the, the physical labor of that, we don't have enough people. So, um, but we were going to be recording audio of certain um, sessions. And we might be recording some of the general sessions as well. So more on that. But again, we, we just want to, um, we just need to wait until we have a little more information. But we do want to have something um, to offer people that can't make it. And if you are a person who cannot go to Hippocamp this year and what you really need is a remote conference, Woodhall Press is offering a remote conference. Matthew, will you just unmute and tell us your dates and give us like a rough sketch of the conference? And we're gonna include in your follow-up email, the link to the Hippocamp registration. And we'll also include the link to the Woodhall conference. Uh, you can go nuts and go to both, but if you're feeling good about live, head for Hippocamp. If you feel like you really need remote, go to the Woodhall conference. Matthew, tell us about your conference. Thanks, thanks so much. Um... Yeah, so August 21st, Saturday, it's kind of the full day. We've got a great lineup. Um, the, the conference starts with a keynote uh, by Gina Bereka, who did an anthology with us um, this year, and we're going to do a second one um, next year. Fast, Funny Women, it's hilarious. She's hilarious. Um, then we go right into uh, a panel, the first panel, um, The Future of Writing, where we've got, you know, all kind of, you know, insurgent and uh, you know, boundary breaking authors like Ashley Renard on that panel. We're going to be, you know, talking about what's next, right? We, we, we're, we're through COVID. We've kind of destroyed the publishing model. Like what's, what do we do now? Um, and then you get the first uh, hour of your workshop and there's six different workshops you can choose from. We've got Allison's doing a workshop. We've got Eugenia Kim, Elena Dillon, um, you know, um, Darian 
Key. We've got a bunch of really good workshops. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. For so us. it's a series of there's group events that we're all at, and then there's breakout rooms with smaller workshops, basically. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And then, the, sorry, the fun, the funnest part, the exciting part is um, we're going to have this book pitch panel. We want to do it like a reality show. So if you have a book that you want to pitch, then um, in your registration, you know, goodie box that has a copy of seven drafts and a bunch of other stuff, um, there'll be instructions for how to, you know, load up like a three minute video on YouTube, pitching your book. And then we'll have a, a bunch of panelists. We've got a guy from Hollywood. We've got one of our um, editors and, and some other folks, uh, one, of, one from our distributor IPG. So some, some folks who can really tell you, give you some good feedback on, you know, where this is going. And then, um, then we wrap up with the, the final keynote, which is, which is Allison um, sending everyone off. So it's all online. Um, we've, you know, we're selling tickets now on Eventbrite and hope to see you there. Awesome. Well, you're still live, Matt. Sorry, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, what I love about that. So what I, okay. When we're talking about gaps, when we're talking about gaps in what we're currently seeing, what people want, that is the space for innovation. So here we have Matthew talking about their new kind of book launching event. I got some chills because that's exciting. I love exciting new things. I also love video. It's not everybody's jam, but you know, Allison and I have been saying since the beginning, if you write like an angel, like an angel, you probably don't need platform. Your query letter and your proposal or your first five pages will just make agents and editors fall at your feet. Most of us are not quite that good. You know, we need to have a bit of platform because like we only write like an angel every other page or less. Um, you know, there's all, it's a sliding scale, both directions. So I love that because there are so many ways to connect with your audience. That's why I call them my audience and not just my readers right now, because video is taking over social media by storm, right? Even, even word only platforms want video now too. Um, so here we have, here we have Woodhall innovating in this way of doing a video book pitch, right? Um, so there are all of these ways that we can all look at, we can all look at what Don is doing, what Matthew is doing, the way that Allison and I have found, you know, just a year ago, found this niche for connecting people who can write really, really well with the skills, with technology and social media and platform and all of the ways so that they can connect those dots. So we all, whether we're talking about the hard of hearing community, whether we're talking about um, people who are not in the special needs or hard of hearing community and want to be a better ally, want to be more, create content that's more accessible, want to do a better job. We are at this crux where all anybody needs to change a habit is a reason why because we're all looking around, we've, you know, reassessed a lot of things in our lives, socially, politically, there's been so much change that we're like, I would like to be a better human. If you can tell me why, if you can tell me why, then done, you know, it's, we're at, we're at that tipping point where people are willing to, to shift into a new mode of being. So I'd like to encourage everybody here to really think of where your expertise and experience fits into that and use these stories here that we're hearing about as an example for how you can do that in your own way. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think too, one of the things I love about Hippocamp, Donna, I always think of your conference as being what I think of as level. Like I've been to writing conferences where there's the keynote speakers and then everybody else is the ticket buying peons who are like lurking around hoping that we'll meet somebody from publishing. And, and Hippocamp's never felt like that to me. Tell us about the environment. Yeah, I think, and it just happened organically. Um, you know, I mean, I think that Hippocampus in general has a friendly vibe and, and our staff members are kind of, you know, outgoing. And, I, and so I think it just, it just kind of set the stage for an event that was really welcoming and friendly. But, but yeah, I mean, we actually, we have um, ribbons that we let people put on their badges. So, if, so we have one for our first time attendee. And we did that for the first time a couple of years ago. And it was just, incredible. Somebody would see that ribbon and they'll be like, oh my gosh, is that your first, it's your first time here. Let me bring you under my wing and, and tell you about this. Um, so it's just, we just try to give everybody a little bit of, a little bit of time to shine 
And I think that just really helps out. I mean, we either have an open mic night or a story slam. Um, we leave lots of rooms for questions and answers. We um, use attendee feedback for the next year's conference. So we really pay attention to our audience and what they want. And I think they're very aware of that and they feel a part of it. And I think that's what makes it so great is that just everybody feels a part of it. You just, you don't feel like you're showing up at something that's unreachable, like Allison said, multiple levels. And I just- And I think you do two things that are really specifically facilitating that kind of experience. And one is, as you mentioned about Tobias Wolf, the speakers are also attending the conference. They're also coming to other people's sessions. And that's a great way to, interact with other people in the audience who are normally the people on the other side of the lectern. And the other thing you do that I really love is everyone who attends has the option to put a book in the bookstore. And I really like that too. It doesn't matter if your book is independently published or if your book is traditionally published. It doesn't matter if you had a run of you know, 50,000 or if you had a run of 50, your book is welcome at the Hippocamp bookstore and people buy each other's books. And I, I think that's just such a beautiful, magical experience. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I see people reviewing each other's books after this or, you know, because a lot of people attend and they might write for this lit mag or this newspaper and they meet people and, you know, they can help them out with an interview or with an article. And there's just so much sharing that happens after. So it's just, it's almost like the conference never ends in a way. <laughs> I love that. Both you and Matt have published uh, anthologies. Uh, Books by Hippocampus has put out one about diners. You've put out one about radio. You've got one coming about writing creative nonfiction and memoir. Um, and Amy asked way back when, how the heck do you get into an anthology? How do you find out there's going to be one? How do you participate? Tell us how that goes. Donna yeah, and then Matt. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of different calls for submissions for anthologies out there. If you go to New Pages, Duotrope, um, I think Submittable has a discovery section where you can look for those opportunities. Um, and I know we all get flooded with email, but I would say just subscribe to Lit Mag newsletters too, because sometimes people will do something special, you know, and other people might have their annual anthology that they do that you know about. Um, so fill up, and what I used to do, um, fill up my calendar with the deadlines, even if I'm not, even if I don't know if I want to do it, at least that deadline and the link is there, I make a Google calendar invite for myself. Um, I haven't been doing that as much, but I used to do it. Um, but I think that's a good tip. And yeah, I would just Twitter, I would, um, I have a Twitter column, I use a program called Hootsuite. I'm getting a little technical here, but basically I search Twitter for call for submissions, anthology call for submissions, freelance call for submissions. So you can do some Google searches and social media searches like that. But but I would just say to subscribe to newsletters and um, yeah, and Matt. Um, um, yeah, all of the above. And um, and gosh, you know, hearing all this about Hippocamp, now I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a great a great thing, and and I know we've had you know lots of feedback from authors like Jamie Chesbro um, was a teacher there. Yeah, so I see his book in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's it right there. Um, so also I think Poets and Writers has a, a place. Um, we're um, you know members of a bunch of these organizations like IBPA, and anytime we do this, um, a call for submissions, we go into all of our membership logins and like you know post it there. So any of the you know industry uh, organizations that you've joined, they may have um, kind of a running you know list of these is where you can submit now. Um, but also, yeah, we use our social media a lot to try and draw up submissions. Like um, we're doing a new uh, anthology coming out in the spring called Non-White and Woman um, that that Darren Gee is um, is editing along with. Uh, Car, I've forgotten the co-editor's name uh, for a minute, but um, the, the submissions are closed, I'm sorry. But um, we did, it, those submissions, thank heavens, went directly um, through one of our interns over to Darien. So, um, you know, a lot of those, the work that we're doing and also, you know, this new anthology with Gina Barreca, um, you know, she's actually handling these more directly. So it's not through the publisher, but you will see, um, you know, different, notices that are that are posted soliciting submissions 
Um, housekeeping wise, we are going to take a little summer break. You're going to get some reruns. Ashley, what is happening? We are taking a summer vacation for the first time. Um, you know, we started in the middle of last summer. We're going to take a couple weeks off and you are going to still get emails on the same schedule, but we're going to give you replays um, with the timeline so that you can revisit some of the things um, that would be really, yeah, we're in rerun season. It is the summer. And then we are going to be coming back live at on Saturday, August 14th for Writers Bridge Live at Hippocamp. And we are going to try to stream that as well. Um, and you'll get the recording for that as well. You know, we'll, we'll let you know closer to the date what platform we're gonna be on for you to watch it live if you can't make it. Um, and then after that, we will get back to our regular season starting, I think it's August 31st and continuing into the fall. Uh, Brian says, hashtag season two coming soon. Uh, we're gonna need like a cool little trailer, I think. You know, our greatest moments, boobs and fire. Um, any other housekeeping things, Ashley, before we get back to Donna for some closing words? Uh, just a reminder that today's recording will come out on Friday because Allison and I are both traveling tonight. We are both getting on planes tonight. Um, and uh, Marisa, thank you. Uh, there is a post-it note behind me that says I need an event page on my website. Yeah, it's been it's been living over there for a while. So, so someday I will put an event an event page on my website. Yeah. And in your follow up email, we will also invite you uh, to join the uh, Hippocamp Facebook page as well, where people are exchanging carpooling information and hotel information. Hey, Donna, will you tell us something beautiful for ourselves as writers that we can take into the world after this lovely time together on the bridge? That is such a big question. I think my biggest advice is just stay curious and keep at it. And I mean, stay curious about the world around you, but also about yourself and the people in it. And you can just continue to mine and mine and mine for story ideas. So just always ask questions. Absolutely. Passion, expertise, curiosity. Make it your job before it's your job. Ashley? The end. Thank you both. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get better than that. Both of you said it. If everyone wants to unmute, to say a lovely goodbye. Bye. 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 Travels, you guys. Bye. 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 Have a good trip. Bye. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye